Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and we are joined today by Dr. Ben Gertzel, who is a cognitive scientist, an artificial intelligence pioneer, and the CEO and founder of Singularity.net. How are you, Mr. Gertzel? Hey, I'm feeling good and happy to be here. Cool, man. Cool. So there's one thing that I wanted to ask you uh, right off the bat as I was preparing for this conversation with you. Um, do you have a background um, of 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 being from Brazil? Like, is that accurate or am I way off on that? Well, I, I was born in Brazil. I'm a Brazilian citizen. My parents are American and uh, I moved away from Brazil when I was like one and a half years old. So I'm, I'm oh. uh, among the world's worst Brazilians, but I'm officially <laughs> a, a Brazilian. I, 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 I've spent a lot of time in Brazil since 1998 though, because I've been working with a bunch of folks in the AI development office in, in Belo Horizonte. So for that, oh. for that reason, which is mostly unrelated to my birth in Brazil in, in 1966. I mean, for, 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 for that reason, because of our AI team in Belo Horizonte, I've, I've been back and forth to Brazil, Brazil quite a lot. And I was, I was there just a month ago or something at the web summit Rio, which was an amazing event. Yeah, that you know, that we we um in my company we have a bunch of outsourced development going on in Brazil. It's like definitely like a very interesting technology hub. I myself lived in Venezuela for seven years as a young child, from like eleven months to seven years old. So we have that kind of South American uh, thing in common, which is cool. Um, just I have to ask uh, because you know people like us, we have many different interests. Do you have any interest in MMA fighting and in the UFC? There's a lot of Brazilian superstars that that are very prominent I've got in that world. Extremely, extremely little interest in the in in that. Actually, I don't know much about it. So. In combat, in combat sports, uh, just yeah. it's never paid much attention to it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No uh, worries, no worries I, at all. I, I I I try to I try to avoid. Uh, combat with a uh, with uh, well muscled <laughs> and violent looking in individuals whenever possible. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. But I do admire that kind of crucible that is the octagon where it's like there's a question who's better and you typically get the truthful answer after the fight is up, right? There's something kind of very archaic I, and beautiful it, about it, that. It, it, it's it's not clear to me how often one gets the truthful answer where it's the result of some uh theatrical man, man, manipulations or, or, or agreements, but that, that, that would be a whole other conversation. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So awesome, man. So, so can you tell me a little bit about how, because your, your career is so vast and it's been going on for such a long time and maybe now in the sort of cultural zeitgeist, uh, AI is, is like, you know, it's like the merry-go-round of like crypto AI uh, metaverse, VR, right? And it just keeps spinning around and around and now AI has become such a prominent thing. But you've been doing it for decades. Can you tell me a little bit about how that became your sort of chosen uh, field of study? Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you have a background in, in science fiction and Star Wars and so on. So my mm. my interest in AI originated with Star Trek, actually, in the I love Star around Trek. it would have been sixty nine or seventy when Kirk and Spock encountered a, a, a robot that was zipping around the universe, <laughs> wreaking mayhem as as AIs in movies and, and TV shows are supposed to do, and the, they defeated it by tricking it with logical paradoxes that its overly mm. rigid mind couldn't comprehend, and that. As a three or four year old kid, that struck me as pretty stupid. I was just like, if this bot is smart enough to travel around the world defeating adversaries, surely it can deal with a a bit of power consistency in its in its, <laughs> in its input, right? But that 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 got me interested in the whole area, and I started reading more science fiction stories and 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 and, and so forth. Then it was, I guess, late nineteen seventies maybe very early 80s, I encountered Douglas Hofstadter's book, Gertel Escher Bach, mm. which was a, you know, a popularization, a big, fat, Pulitzer Prize winning popularization. And, but it went over some 
of the actual work on AI being done by university professors in the AI research field. And that sort of introduced me at age 14 or so to the notion that there was an AI research field, right? And the, mm. and the people were really trying to do this. It wasn't just in the far off science fictional future. And this was a, this was quite fascinating to me. I ended up doing a PhD in math rather than AI because most of the work being done in the AI field at that time was boring to me. It was like rule-based expert systems where you're trying to feed the AI rules, telling it exactly what to do, which clearly was like not, to me, felt like not the right approach. I, I thought AI should learn from its own experience and recognizing patterns in itself and, 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 and the world and all that, right? So, but immediately after getting my PhD in math, I started working on AI and cognitive science, trying to understand how, how thinking works. I did this AI research as an academic for eight or 10 years entered industry in the late 90s and then started sort of dual path of working on research toward artificial general intelligence, real thinking machines that can make imaginative creative leaps, generalizing beyond their programming and training. And on the other hand, building narrower, more specialized AI systems like doing, doing real stuff, which was both interesting to see AI doing real stuff and was a way to earn a living to make AI systems doing doing real stuff because outside of academia, no one wants to pay you just to do research on how to make how to make thinking machines. I got into the intersection of AI and blockchain in 2017. Mm. I mean, it was a crystallization of a long interest I had in how to make a democratically controlled, globally distributed infrastructure for AI. Blockchain turned out to be a technology that, that enables that and then I founded Singularity Net, which is a decentralized, you know, blockchain-based protocol and platform for mm. for AI systems. And now, you know, AI is exploding all over the place since uh, Chat GPT, which is an amazing product launch. I mean, not yeah. not such an original technology. The core tech there was developed at at Google and existed internally within Google for a while, but I mean, OpenAI put it out there in a yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a great job way for the retail audience, and now, now everyone loves AGI and everyone's worried about AGI and everyone's yeah. thinking about is ChatGPT really progress toward toward AGI? So I mean, I'm I'm working on both. How do you put large language models like the one behind ChatGPT together with other kinds of AI? in the right cognitive architecture to really move toward AGI. And at, at, at the same time, how do you deploy this kind of system in a democratic and decentralized way? So, you know, corporate and governmental interests don't take control mm -hmm. over the emerging AGI for their own narrow ends, but rather as we effect the transition from today's not quite yet human level AGI to tomorrow's human level and superhuman AGI as we affect that transition. Like how do we, how do we make sure it comes out well? And I think the way to make the surest we can, it comes out well is to make its control and ownership as democratic and decentralized as possible. Mm. Well, there's so much, there's so much there and so much that I have a lot of personal experience with recently because like you and I were talking before we started, I've been integrating a lot of um, AI tools into my platform. And one of the things that I've you know discovered is this idea of the closed AIs like OpenAI and ChatGPT um, and the sort of open source AIs like Stable Diffusion and such and the communities around something like... Um, even the large language models like Alpaca and Pygmalion and, and some of these kind of smaller large language models, but that have sort of fostered these incredible open source communities where the iteration just seems so fast, you know, and something like auto GPT, which is an open source platform that uses the chat GPT API seems like it was, moving at such a fast speed that something like OpenAI had to launch plugins and they had to launch, you know, all these other features to almost compete 
with the sort of trends that were happening in auto GPT. My question being, do you think that it's vital? Because I believe it's vital, but maybe I don't have all the info that AI needs to push itself towards being an open source uh, you know, technology where that, that 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 isn't controlled by any one particular company, but actually controlled by the community that drives its progress. I think it's almost certainly the best way to smooth the transition from here to to superhuman AGI. Now it it might be that superhuman AGI is just going to be what it's going to be somewhat independently of, 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 of the route. I mean, sort of like the, you know, the launch mechanism for a spacecraft is one thing. And then once you're in outer space, flying is, is, is a different thing than, than, than launching mm-hmm. out, out of orbit. Right. So, I mean, it might be that once you get a super smart AGI system, that's beyond human level intelligence, it just, verges into certain attractors of thinking that are somewhat independent of the precise route. We can't be sure, right? I mean, or or it could be there's like fundamentally different species of superhuman AGI and that which route we use to launch the AGI will have a big impact on which species we, we launch. You- I, I tend more toward the former hypothesis that there's a certain <clears throat> like superhuman mind attractor that AI is going to converge to it. But I mean, we're really speculating pretty, pretty yeah, wildly. Yeah. Right. On the other hand, the transitional phase I think is a little clearer, like on the route from here to human level AGI, it's pretty clear that who owns and controls that transitional AGI as it develops through the human level is going to have a big difference in terms of how well the transition goes for the human beings on, on, on the planet, right? And I, I think yeah. there, there is where there's a clear big difference. Like if in a certain country or a certain company controls the AGI as it passes through all the stages to, to, to human level intelligence. I mean, this is unlikely to be for the good of the, of the, of the, of the whole planet. Right. And I mean, I agree. I, 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 whereas if it's done in a democratic decentralized way, it's more likely to be for the good of the whole planet. And I think we have, we have a couple examples in the computing domain recently, the internet itself, and the Linux operating system, which have been things that have been developed, broadly speaking, in an open and decentralized way, and on the whole, dramatically for the good of, of humanity in, in both cases, I would say. Not, not that terrorists and other bad guys can't use the internet and Linux, they can. They're not the cleverest ones at using it, and they're not the majority of the, of, of the use of these sure. things, right? Um, the fact that these are developed in a way that's not owned and controlled by a small set of individuals or, or con- one country, one company, it's been it's been really good. I mean, look look how exploitative mobile is compared to the compared to the the, the, the regular internet, and look how elitist Apple, that while they make great products, is compared to Linux, right? I mean, the the yeah yeah proprietary siloed off approach clearly is not the way to promote broad benefit. And what what I think big companies and governments want to do, they want to scare people. They, they, they want to be like, well, if you don't let us control all the AI, then the bad guys will get it and, and use, oh, use it against you. That like, gets me so angry fact, just hearing like, that. These, these are these are the bad guys telling you that. Right, right exactly, <laughs> exactly. Let me, let's take one step back because I think it's an important thing in terms of literacy for my audience that maybe doesn't have a full grasp of all the sort of key terms. Could you explain short, like, like briefly what AGI is? Yeah. AGI or artificial general intelligence refers to AI. That Which is a term that you can, help sort of bring to popularity. It is a term that I introduced. I basically introduced into the world in 2004 or, 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 or five by editing a book with the title artificial general intelligence. It, 
Turned out, unknown to me, someone had introduced that term in an article like in, in, in the late 90s. I mean, but I mean, words will pop up all, all, all over the place. And I've organized every year since 2006 the Artificial General Intelligence Conference Series, which is an annual research conference. And mm -hmm. it's held every year in a different place. It's in Stockholm, June 16th, 19th this year. The talks oh, will nice. also be online. So technical research stuff, super interesting stuff. Oh, I'll, in. I'll be there. I'll what, make sure that my developers are there too. It's very important. But yeah, what AGI means, it's AI that can generalize to a significant, hopefully dramatic degree beyond its programming and training. So, I mean, it can take what it learned and what it's been programmed to do and then deal with qualitatively different situations. And I mean, that's that can be boiled down mathematically in, in, in various ways. So it's it's not so waffly. There, there's math definitions of it. One, one thing that you find is when you formalize this mathematically, you quickly come to the conclusion human beings are not all that generally intelligent, right? We're, mm. we're almost like the minimal general intelligence that's smart enough to... <clears throat> you know, understand what the notion of general intelligence is and, and build build new intelligences. I mean, as a few examples, you know, I can't run a maze in 7,000 dimensions very well. Mm. If you generate an arbitrary mathematical theorem of length, like a thousand characters, even though I'm a math PhD, it will take me a very long time to, to prove it. I can barely tell what my wife is thinking half the time, right? I mean, so, <laughs> and and we, we get along great. She's a wonderful person. So, yeah. I mean, we're just, we're not that super generally intelligent compared to the possible systems out there within our physical universe. We are, in many senses, it seems more generally intelligent than the other animals on, 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 on the planet. And it seems that we should be able to engineer systems that are more generally intelligent than us, you know, by giving them architectures inspired by how our minds work, mm. fulfilling these architectures with best of breed algorithms that we come up with, and then setting these algorithms to learn from the world, which is much more information and complexity than we're able to understand. Yeah, that's that's that, that that's quite fascinating. And this this concept of artificial general intelligence. Is this, you think, basically what the kind of the chat GPTs of the world are sort of doing in practice, right? Like, it's like, you know. No, you I, I think I, I, actually they're, they're an illusion of general intelligence. Because okay. a system, a large language model, like the models underlying chat GPT and such, actually don't generalize very far beyond their training data. Mm but they can appear general to us as individuals because their training data is much bigger than any of us as an individual. Like the, the training data is the whole goddamn web, right? So right. since their training data is sort of everything modern humanity does, they don't have to extrapolate very far beyond their training data to do most of anything you, 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 you would ask them to do. So if you take... Take music as an example. I see you got a bunch of guitars behind you, and I've got yeah. a, I've got a Hendrix album cover on, 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 on the wall behind me. So oh I, yeah, I yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. There you go. Bold as love, man. That that was that was that that album was. Oh my man, first that's, a, that's, 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 the that's the that, one. That's the one. I can't take amazing. my eyes off it now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm a keyboardist. I'm only an amateur. Oh wow, okay. But, yeah, most most but, and, most mathematicians that I know are are have this natural gift for music. It's funny how I've always loved music. Yeah, I, actually, I'm I'm playing in a band now, Gem Galaxy Band, with a robot as a lead vocalist. So we, we've kind oh, of trying to bring nice. music and AI together in a way. We, very we're, nice. We're going to launch some uh, metaverse concert material sometime soon. Actually, oh man, I got to show you my like, platform because it's all set up for for full on. Like this is being broadcasted into my podcast room inside of the platform, but anyway, I'm sorry. So continue your yeah, thoughts. We, should, we like, should look at that. We did we did a whole gig with like 12 camera volumetric video recording and stuff. To, oh, to, very cool. But yeah, so if you think in music, ChatGPT isn't actually that great in music, but you have Music LM from Google, and you'll have a whole bunch of other similar large language type models for music coming out and mm -hmm. what you will be able to do with a model like that is say like 
Okay, play me a 12-bar blues, maybe a few Middle Eastern scales in there, like a start off slow, go into some neoclassical metal, then, you know, end with a bass and drum solo, right? And you can give an instruction like that. It will compose and play a song like that, right? Mm -hmm. And voice is going to be a little harder. I mean, but it's also it's also coming along, right? So you'll be mm -hmm. able to say like, okay, sing a, you know, like a, Mutant offspring of Muddy Waters and Bjork, and then the AI will come up with something which will sound, sound really cool. That's a very interesting mix you gave there. Like, let, that, that's a good prompt. Muddy yeah, Waters but and so Bjork. The thing is, the thing is, yeah, because they're, they're both a bit rough, right? It should be cool. But the, the, the thing is, this is a combination of stuff that's in the training data set. Now, think about what Jimi Hendrix did or Think about the origin of jazz or take the experiment. Say, let's mm. say you trained a large language model on all music up to the year 1900 mm. and didn't give it any music from after the year 1900. That LLM, <clears throat> it will never invent jazz. It will never invent speed metal. I mean, even, even if setting aside the technical invention of new instruments, it will never invent new genres of music. Like if, mm. if you ask it to put together Mozart with West African rhythms, I mean, it, it, it will give you Mozart's Turkish march in, in, in polyrhythms and different time signatures, but it's not going to give you Duke Ellington or, or John Coltrane or Miles Davis, right? Because there's the thing is the leap from the music before 1900 onto... New Orleans jazz, let alone progressive jazz and, and Hendrix and Snarky Puppy and whatnot, right? I'm, I mean, that leap is not just combining together observed patterns on, on the surface level, which is what LLMs are good at. Mm -hmm. In a way, it is based on concept blending and combination of what was there before. Like you, after the fact, you could look at jazz and say, well, we got the chord patterns and harmonies from classical and gospel music and we got rhythms from west african drumming but it's combining these things at a at a deeper level right and the llm these neural nets don't do that they don't represent things at a deeper level so they can't blend and combine them at, at a deeper level so they're not they're not as fundamentally creative as human individuals and collectives are at their best mm. now that that's a real limitation and it I mean, it's an important one. They have other limitations. I mean, they can't write science papers. They can't do complex multi-step reasoning like you do to do really original science. But both of these things I mentioned, like inventing a new genre of music right, or doing highly original science with complex multi-step reasoning, both of these things by their nature are like leaping way beyond the whole cultural base of knowledge, right? So that's that's something they can't do. On the other hand, if you look at them from an economic perspective or even a humanitarian perspective of helping people, a very small percent of what happens on the planet has to do with leaping far beyond the whole cultural base of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not, 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 not too much does. I mean, very few people do that in, in, their, in, their, in their lifetime. So if you look right. at like people's jobs, okay, what percent of people's jobs our minor variations are, are involved doing minor variations on stuff other people did like almost oh, man, all of that's, them, right? <laughs> that's a brilliant insight you're 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 so right which makes me feel like my job is one that that I've always invented my job right like throughout my career it's always like how can i position myself to evolve beyond where everybody else is sometimes it fails sometimes it succeeds you know but that's a very interesting right. uh, insight that's a small percent of the economy that's like that, right? Yeah. And so that and that's so that's what I think economically. I mean, there's friction in deploying technology in, 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 into reality, obviously, because say like McDonald's in the U.S. still have a human pushing the hamburger button. Well, in Asia, for a long time, you go in and push a hamburger button on a tablet instead, which makes, <laughs> right. makes more sense, right? So there's friction in rolling out like already working very obvious technologies. But setting that aside, if you ask what jobs fundamentally can't be done by chat GPT style technology well integrated, I mean, 
there's jobs that involve foundational human connection, which is like a, you know, a preschool teacher, a th therapist, and so forth. I mean, you just, it's mm -hmm. about humans helping each other to be better humans. It's got to be human to human, right? I mean, then, then, yeah, there's jobs that involve really deep innovation, like a scientist or someone at the cutting edge of some form of creative art or a, you know, business strategist or executive who's going into markets that never existed before. Sure. So th th these are things that are hard to routinize. What percent of the job market is that? Right. I mean, right, right, not, right. Not, not, su not super high. Right. So this, uh, what's interesting to me is a lot of the economic disruption I previously thought was going to happen only after we had human level AGI. It seems we can get a lot of that economic disruption even before we get human level AGI. Interesting. Just yeah. by these sort of repeater and recombiner systems that take everything on the internet and recombine it for new applications in the in a context specific way. So so in some kind of romantic way of looking at what you just said, which is fascinating by the way, and it's given me a ton to think about, is AGI is essentially that sort of creative leap beyond the data set, beyond the training data. It's yeah, like, that's right. And you know, you know, I have a I have a two year old and a five year old. I have, I have three other kids that grew up a long time ago, and a, a five year old granddaughter. I'd say these little ones are making those creative leaps all the time. Actually, like being a one or two year old, half your life is making huge creative leaps many of which are wrong, and then you scream in frustration. So, I mean, I think right. we're all capable of, do, of doing that. It's just that's not what we end up doing in most of our, our lives because we have to get resources. And the, the best way to get resources to survive once you're grown up is to repeat something you already know how to do that works with a greater, with a greater re, 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 reliability. So, I mean, well, I've been focusing on, you know, Hendrix or Einstein or something because those were folks who had a big impact on the world and, and made a living and more doing radical creativity. But I think every human brain has that capability. And we, we I mean, we exercise it as, as children. First of all, it's fascinating because like hearing you speak, it makes me think of 2001 and uh, in 2001, I'm a huge film buff. It's one of my favorite movies. And in 2001, um, there's the moment, the sort of with the music of Thus Spoke Zarathustra in the background yeah, yeah. of of the. My, my, old, my oldest son is named Zarathustra, actually. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, yeah. Seems like we have a lot in common, you and I. Um, so you know the Thus Spoke Zarathustra moment where the ape man, right, like like uh, you know the primitive hominid realized that if he took that leap of the bone, that he could defend his territory with an yeah. unfair force over the other tribe right and hence the idea of technology being born and he throws the bone in the air the next shot you get is humans in space right it, which is like that's yeah. all it took was that one leap but now the interesting thing about what you're saying is now i think about the scene when the two astronauts go and try to hide from hal in the capsule and hal is looking at them can't hear them but he they can see hal can see their lips moving and Hal detects, yeah. hey, I'm in danger. Like, these guys are talking shit about me. And then Hal makes that leap beyond his training yeah. to kill them, right? So just, yeah. like the, just like the hominid, Hal has that leap. So, wow, to think that Stanley Kubrick was thinking AGI back in those days without the ability to articulate that is, you know, makes me love him even more. But it, yeah, it's a about, of course, if you... So I, in the early 70s, I mean, I saw 2001 when I was a little kid and it, it was great. But I think just reading amazing science fiction and analog science fiction magazine, I mean, you had many, many, many SF stories dealing with these issues at a quite high level of, of sophistication in, in, mm. in print more so than, in, than in, in, in movies, right? So I think these ideas have been explored in profound ways for long mm. for a long time and i think in my generation of ai researchers many of us got into ai that way from science fiction so our minds are full of the broader possibilities i think it's different 
now young people going into AI, they're going into it because their mom told them it's a good way to make money or something. It's like people sure. became a people became a, became a business major in the in the eighties when I was in college, right? But but in my generation, I mean, I'm fifty six. In my generation, we got into AI because of these wild science fictional visions, right. and you know, it was it was it was clear that you know what, yeah, once you get to AIs that can think as well as a human, yes. They're going to make their own leaps beyond. Now, Hal, of course, Hal was under sort of dictatorial control of the humans, mm -hmm. which uh, you know is a classic context in which the the table the tables get get turned, and suddenly your, your servant is your is your is your master, right? So mm -hmm. I think we can't know for sure, but I think we don't want to implant this whole mental complex of dictatorial control into the ai in in the first place we want to have compassion toward the ai raise it as our child and 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 our our, our partner so that its mind is is full of this sort of mirrored back compassion toward us as i mean it's as as it becomes mm -hmm. more more and more in, in, intelligent and i mean i think this is actually a reason why one of the reasons why i think the military can't be where AGI first emerges because mm. I, I did work with the U.S. military and intelligence in the previous part of my career, and they, they always want obey to obey doctrine, right? And I mean, in big tech, it's not quite that bad, but you always want AI to be optimizing the metrics of the, of, of, of the company running, sure. it, right? And you know, my two-year-old is not good at obeying doctrine nor at optimizing <laughs> the metrics that that, that, I, that I that I give her. Not 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 whatsoever like the early stages of becoming a generally intelligent mind have more to do with like just wild play and and ex 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 exploration and these are not that compatible with leading and leading an army or optimizing a business's metrics right and i think this is this is a reason for some optimism right and i think actually that you know sandbox games in the metaverse have more potential than military or say advertising companies mm. as a breeding ground for young agis just because if you design an environment where the ai characters are just supposed to be roaming around interacting with each other and with people learning as they go i mean i think that's that's the right sort of environment for the algorithms to sort of self-organize and, and, and crystallize toward AGI. But that doesn't mean that once the AGI evolves in a more open-ended and free-form environment, it doesn't mean someone won't try to then take it over or copy it and, and make a version that's perverted toward different sorts of ends. So. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, that, that that's a fascinating thing you just said. In our platform, we have this little experiment going where we have, um, you know, GPT powered NPCs that roam the world that have their own sort of character profile that's unique to them. And we allow them to interact with all of the stable diffusion based inputs in the world. And when they get within proximity of the input, they can create a prompt that generates art in the world. Uh, so, which is like a really interesting thing. We haven't really seen anything emergent coming out of it, but to your point, that that idea of this collision of AI, maybe there's like a moment, right, where like it just learns more. But you know, for me, the thing that I've been really um, like into, and in my kind of prediction, and maybe I don't know. After hearing you talk, I'm like rethinking half the shit that I know. But um, my prediction is that the commodity of AI is really driven by the data sets that you use to enhance your AI to do specific tasks. And it's a lot more prevalent for me with the art stuff than it is with the large language model because we pretty much just use ChatGPT because it's so much better than like Lambda and, uh, I'm sorry, not Lambda, uh, uh, Llama, Llama and Alien and like some of the smaller sort of open source ones. But with the art GPT ones, um, you can really train it to like be like Van Gogh or you train it to be like Picasso in the blue period or you train it to be this or you train yeah. it to be that. And I've started to collect my own 
sort of like repertoire of Loras, right? We call them Loras, you know, I, I'm not even sure what a Laura is, but that's what they're called in the file. And like, we have this incredible cat, like catalog of Loras that I feel very protective of because it's, it's what I taught the AI to create a very specific output. And when you start blending these Loras with each other, the kind of creativity that you start to get from the system is quite fascinating. So my question is, do you think that the art generative models are a little bit further ahead in the illusion of AGI over the large language models? I, I, th I think it's... Uh... Let me let me let me let me think about that for 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 a moment. I, I mean, yeah. I'm I'm not I'm not sure how true that would be cross culturally. I, I, actually, mm. it's 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 an it's an interesting question. It's it's certainly true in the cultural context that 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 we're in, but that may have to do with the different roles that images versus versus yes, uh, yes. verbiage plays in our in our own society because we we mostly make images for entertainment. And right, and the, we use we use text. And images have a much broader interpretation field than words, right? Words yeah, have for a much for for, for us, but I'm I'm imagining a society in which the, the practical communication w was pictorial instead of word based. And then, oh man, then oh god, you just gave me a great idea, Ben. I got to talk to you more. Um, I got to make a Laura. Yeah, but, no, in, in our current society. So let let me ju just uh, give one context in which that's true, like in. In our society now, if you hallucinate random stuff that's not real in an image, it mostly just looks cool, right? Because we're usually yeah. not trying to generate photorealistic, like simulated pictures of the world around us. There's we can just generate weird looking stuff and we like it. And then in text, we're more often trying to generate stuff that's a faithful reproduction of an aspect of the mm -hmm. world. So the hallucination that LLMs do is more is more often bad, right? So I, mm. I mean that that's that's sort of a difference in what we're doing with the, with the the media. Because if we were if we were more often just making surrealistic prose poems, then hallucination right. and text wouldn't matter. And if we were more often making images photorealistically depicting part of the world, then the hallucination would. Would, would, would matter, right? So it seems like the same strengths and weaknesses are there. They just have a different relevance within within our culture. But I also, I want to go back to a previous point that you made. And I think right now, the intelligence of AI systems is very heavily data set driven, right? But mm. I, I wouldn't assume that'll be the case two years from now. Mm. I mean, that, so we, we need to be careful about overfitting to the state of AI as it is today. Just like mm, prompt engineering is a big thing now. So people are like, everyone will work as a prompt engineer, right? But what, what may happen a few a couple of years from now is you get AIs that are a little further short AGI. They can make leaps beyond their training data more so than exactly what data they are trained on matters less than now because they're extrapolating more beyond their training data. And on oh. the other hand, you'll have more and more AI systems that are good at taking people's informal crappy specifications and translating them into precise prompts. So mm -hmm. that having humans who are good at nitty gritty prompt engineering becomes, becomes much less relevant. And that turns out to have been a skill that was a big deal for like two or three years before the prompt engineering itself was, was, was mostly automated. Right. So, uh, That's so fascinating. I think yeah. there, yeah, there's certain vibe to AI a la 2022-23, and that that may shift as we make significant partial progress toward AGI from where we are now. Yeah, that's very interesting because since I deal with the LLMs and the generative art stuff so much, they are very unique from each other and like how you train them and how you apply them. And the interesting thing about the generative AR, AI models is that I've learned through hours of iteration that the goal is to get less and less and less and less prompt, right? Where you pretty much 
just say like one word prompts or two word prompts and it gives you exactly what you want because the combination of the checkpoint and the Laura are so tuned with each other that you can predict what you're going to get better, right? Like, like you know what you want without having to type these crazy long prompts and all these negative prompts that the goal with the art stuff is smaller prompts, but with the tech stuff, you know, for me, my frustration with the tech stuff is that I can't train it as easily as I can train the art stuff, right? Like, for example, well, what if you were what if you were trying to get stable diffusion to give you a picture, which was the answer to a question you had? It might take the same lengthy, tedious prompt engineering, though. Mm, that's an interesting. That's an interesting angle. Could could you give me an example of that? Like a question, like two plus two type of question. Oh, that I mean that 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 it, that it just wouldn't be able to do but let, let, or like a say, house that protects you from the rain or say, let's say what 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 kind of person is likely to be walking outside a bar in las vegas you know at, at 4 a.m mm, on the morning after the national rodeo finals right, right and then like, you're like, going to try to get to give you a picture of exactly that drunken like a cowboy poser right and then <laughs> it's going to give you something different you're going to be adding on and tweaking the prompt until it gives you exactly the answer to your question. Yeah, that's maybe. That's, first of all, I'm gonna, that, that, that's a very interesting experiment. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna try that after we we finish this. Yeah, I mean, this, you because because I've so I've done I I've tried to do things like that and usually gave up. Right, like I was I was trying to get a number of LLMs to make a certain sort of picture. Like I I was one of my colleagues was screwing with with some of these image generation AI. They made a very cool picture of, of, of a lab with all these weird aquariums and tanks and different things flo floating around in it. And, you know, I, I wanted to get it to put a certain futurist pundit who I don't like very much in one of those tanks, like swimming around. <laughs> right? and, and I screwed around with the prompts a long time to try to get that to happen. And but it was but, just but like to try to get that to happen by subtext, not by explicit, but implicit. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I, could, I couldn't. Yeah, I mean, you could just do it in Photoshop, right? But I mean, I mean, I was trying to get the prompt to just make it happen. And right, right, right. Even even if you ask it to put the guy in the box, it like put a big version of his head in the box, not the whole body. I mean, it's it's quite hard to get it to do what you want to do. Actually, it's just when you're generating images, you're usually more open regarding regarding what what you what what you what you're gonna get, and with text you're often more precise if you get a very nice answer to a different question you're still you're you're annoyed right and but i think i think all this will be handled by sort of meta services where you have an ai that understands you it takes your crude prompt that isn't well honed it understands what you want and it translates this into refined prompts out there because the, the the nature of formulating a prompt may be different for the di different different models. I mean that's already true to 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 to, to, some, to some extent. So that's will be will be in interesting to see where yeah. that where that goes. And of course, being science fiction oriented, it's easy to envision like uh, put some EEG leads on your head, right? And mm -hmm. then you just you're because we we can already take a rough image from someone's visual cortex and we can read it using a bunch of EEG on your head. So sure. what if you just think of an image, it takes your crude neural imagination of an image and then turns that into prompts to a bunch of LLMs. And then you see like a, a beautifully fleshed out improved version of what you're visualizing in, 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 in your mind's eye. Right. I, th I think there's, there's going to be a lot of different, interfaces that for music that would be incredible right like you yeah yeah you hear in your head you hear in your head a sort of crude version of something you're like well what what would this melody sound like if uh early Z led zeppelin was playing it right and then right, then right. or or the like LLM feeling... performs that and it performs that interpolation and it won't it won't sound exactly like it did in your head but of course as a composer when you go from the sound in your head to what you can play and record it always transforms a bit in that in that in that in that process yeah. and, and like for the me, LLM, music, LLM can do that also 
you know, for me, music has always been a sort of a catharsis and kind of a, kind of like therapy. It's been very therapeutic, right? Typically, I got into music because it really helped me when I was, you know, sad, right? It really helped me when I was angry. Yeah. It really helped me to sort of have an outlet for emotions that are typically negative, and it somehow turns it into this positive, you know, catharsis, right? It's like when when the LLM can sort of interpret those those feelings and those emotions, um, yeah. and like what leap does it make, right? Does it paint you a positive image, or does it paint you the negative image, or does it paint you a sarcastic well, image what to make a joke out of it? LLM can respond appropriately to human emotions without having any fundamental understanding of human emotions right which is a, is a weird thing just like with with ethics so you can you can ask gpt4 all manner of ethical questions like here's a specific situation involving these people and their love relationships and stealing stuff ask it you know was bob right or wrong to to tell janet this thing and the llm will infer what most modern humans would consider the most ethical thing to do without in the normal sense any understanding of any of these things it's just looking at similar situations depicted in the past on the internet and sort of merging together what people thought was right in other similar similar situations right so i mean the same way with the connection between human emotion and music there's so many examples out there. It could do a decent job of that for existing genres, even without empathizing or understanding what your 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 right right feeling is. Because because the but language going, right there, there there's a lexicon to it right. There's like there's implied. a lexicon within the genre. Yeah, but across genres, the lexicon gets gets reinvented, which goes back to, I think, the inability of these sorts of AI systems to invent a new genre like they're they're learning the lexicons that they hear but they're not they're not going to get a new a new lexicon right and i, I mean I, I think like they're the not way gonna innovate right because that's what you're talking about that agi moment is that moment where the it goes beyond its original programming right it goes beyond the data set and creates a new data set is that is that the output where it now it understands well, this new data set was born out of this old data I mean, of set? Of course, it could create a new data set. But I, I mean, the, when you're creating something new, then the, the generative model comes first and the data set comes after, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you invent a new genre of music or a new branch of science, first you're getting the ideas and then you're, then you're generating the, 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 the content because it's something the generation comes first and then the discrimination after, unlike in the case of the sort of modeling that the, the, the LLMs are, 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 are doing now. So, the, yeah, I think for music, art, and literature, now large language models, I mean, they're understanding the surface level patterns. They're not getting the relation between human experience, be it emotional or cognitive, and the and the produced mm. artworks. And this is part of why they can't be as fundamentally creative as humans can be at their at their their best, right? Yeah, I mean, for me, of course, yeah, music at times can have an emotional catharsis, certainly. It also helps me think through things. Like mm. your mind gets modeled when you're trying to think something through you play music, it's so orderly it's and, and well arranged and, and, yeah. and perfect. Then some some somehow your your ideas ide ideas follow along, right? And and everything then when you get up from the, the piano, then suddenly what seemed confusing has become abs absolutely clear. Like the the emotional cobwebs that were yeah gumming up your thinking have been have been swept away and the, you know music lm doesn't have that chat gpt doesn't have the analog of that that you get from from writing where the process of writing can bring you clarity right i mean mm. 
writing technical things clarifies the ideas journaling can clarify your emotions right and that, mm. that the ais don't have that now and i think i think to an extent they have to have something like that in order to be able to fundamentally fundamentally create radical new things not exactly the same way that, that that humans do but they have to have some analog of that process that's grounding the artworks in experience right and i mean there's there's results in learning theory which connect generalization with occam's razor with like compact modeling so if you have a mm -hmm. data set and you've modeled it in a very concise way that's one way of showing that you know how to generalize the principles in that data set further beyond beyond that specific data set. Mm -hmm. LLMs don't do that. They don't do Occam's razor like concise modeling very well. They're, they're, they're very big. And I think this is tied with their difficulties with, with sort of profound generalizations and, 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 and creative leaps. But I, I think, you could use an LLM to help train and accelerate the learning of a different sort of AI that does make more concise models, which is what I'm working on with, with OpenCog system. Now, like hybridizing LLMs with logical reasoning systems and, and evolutionary learning systems that seek concise models. And so I would, I would hypothesize the so really- cross references. So a, a LLM that is trained on X data set sort of asks the cognitive thinking part of it it's the other way around the, cog the cognitive system asks the llm stuff so the, L the llm system is a sort of oracle for the cognitive system as, as it, right, as it right. learns because it wow. can give faster and more diverse responses than, than than physical reality you can ask it anything in in, in, in parallel so yeah we're using the llms as sort of training training oracle to to help help give many, many, many training examples. So sort of like in in a game playing architecture like Alpha Zero, you use a simulation engine of Go or Chess to mm. a, a, as a training oracle for, for, for a game tree system, right? So you, you can use an LLM as a training oracle for a logical reasoning or evolutionary evolutionary learning system. But so my hypothesis is when you've done that at large scale for creative arts, your compact model of you know, great music, great, great pictures, great literature, whatever your compact model is, is going to have sort of emotional and experiential responses b b baked into it in a way. I, th I think that is, that is a lot of the concise model. It's not all right. Like in music, music theory is part of the concise model, but human emotion is also part of the concise model, right? Because mm -hmm. in a way, in a way, human music is what happens when human emotional and physiological response meets the basic math of music theory and that gives you that gives you human music music lm doesn't summarize that in a concise way i think other sorts of ai systems can be made to summarize that in a concise way and then those ai systems are the ones that will be able to to create new new, new genres of, of of music or or say generate appropriate music for totally new metaverse content or something right because now yeah, yeah now when you generate music to go along with what happens in the metaverse you're repurposing real world music you you, you you're, you're not building new music just for metaverse experience right i mean that that's another interesting example of how would you jump beyond beyond your 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 your, your training data and generate some totally new form of music like what what's the right kind of music to play for a character as they run through an environment and the physical laws of that environment change and the nature of their body change, right? Like we, right. there's no, there's no appropriate music for that. In right. the history with prompts of that are like with prompts that are determined by action versus by, by literal yeah. words. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, you, you know, can what... come up with something using current LLMs that will be cool, but it's, it's all taking music that was invented for a normal human embodiment and cutting and pasting it to get music that's appropriate for a, a totally different virtual environment. But the, there should be new genres of music to depict the novel aspect 
of living in a, in, 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 in a virtual world. And yeah. I, I don't think an LLM will get that either. I think brilliant humans could do that or new sorts of AIs could do that. You know, you know, for me, much like you, I was extremely inspired by Star Trek and, you know, I'm, I'm slightly younger than you, not by much. Um, and I was more of the, you know, the next generation Star Trek, right? Yeah, I, 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 I watched, I watched that too. And you, you had, you had Mr. Data, who was sort of a, right. He was, he, he was also, he was also interesting. He was in, in a way, how boring he was was the most interesting thing about him, right? <laughs> that, that, that right. was a, that was a peculiar. Right. Peculiar vision of, of of an AI, which was also disappointing in its own way. But I think in the in the Star Trek or Star Wars universe, AI had gotten too interesting that would have broken all the all the premises of of, of 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 those universes, right? Like you you couldn't you couldn't have a super AI in those universes yeah. without it you becoming know, becoming you dominant know. and breaking all their plot and character conceits, you really. Know. You know, for me, the thing about Star Trek that really stuck with me from the second that I saw it sort of shown to me is this idea of sort of Plato's uh, cave evolved to its endpoint, right? And the endpoint of Plato's cave in Star Trek is something called the holodeck, right? Where you just kind of walk in to this room and you utter words and then the computer generates a simulation to sort of match those words and completely engulf you in a indiscernible simulation based on your words. So in, in our project, we created, you know, something we call the dream deck, right? Very f similar to the holodeck. And you walk in there and based on skybox and like, you know, like 180 or 360 degree Laura's, you're able to say X thing and you're, completely transported into a completely different world now to your point from earlier we haven't been able to get 3d models and 3d objects within the world right it's just a flat texture that gives you the impression of being inside a skybox um, but you know to me that's what we're edging closer to right it's like being able to you know yeah, user generated I, I think content. Within, the, within the next couple years within the next couple years we will get you know, generative AI to let people create their own 3D content in metaverses with tremendous facility, and I, I mean that 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 will be that will be an, an really sort of black, black swan moment for metaverse, I think, because then you'll yeah. just be able to make amazing. Oh man, anyone I'd love who to can show you imagine it in their mind. Out. Yeah, anyone can imagine it in their mind. We'll be able to make amazing. Do, do you have a VR that, headset? Do you own a I VR don't, headset? I don't anymore. No, I, 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 I did. I, I, I gave, I gave them to some of our, some of our development shops. But right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, yeah. Because I'd love to walk you around it because I believe that I'm actually, I haven't seen anything in the market that's as close as to where I am with it. Um, and I'm very, very proud of that. You know, one thing well, that I I'm going to have to get one of the new Apple headsets. But oh no, you're not. Long, no, you're so. not. That, that's like uh, thirty-five hundred dollars. You can get pretty much the same exact thing for six hundred dollars. You know, there, there, there's not a ton. As somebody who lives that world twenty-four-seven, oh, yeah. I mean, there's there's obvious visual improvements in the statistics of the pixel density: twenty-three million pixels versus seven million which is, you know, a beautiful step up, but you know, anyway, um, you can, you can get a lot. Well, of I will, I will, I'll happily take your advice on, 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 on what headset to get. It's, it's been a few years since I had a virtual. Oh man, I'd headset, love, I'd so. love to show you this because I think you walk I mean, we, around. We, we had a couple of the, we had, we had some of the earlier Facebook headsets and use them to do some some, yeah, yeah, those are good. Those are good. You know, the, some Uni, OS. 3D, Uni 3D development and so forth. I, know, I left, I left mine in our our Ethiopia lab where they where they were doing a bunch of, of oh, okay, yeah, Uni, yeah, yeah, Uni yeah, yeah, 3D world development. But uh, yeah, you know, you, you, you know, one thing, the last thing, because I know we're we're getting, you know, we're uh, you're very generous with your time, and I'm starting to get abusive of your time here. Uh, but one thing that I would, I, I definitely wanted to chat with you about because I'm also very big into the whole blockchain thing. I've been around crypto, you know, pretty much from, from, from the beginning. 
um, you know, like as a speculator when Bitcoin was around nine dollars. So I'm very, very familiar with with all the blockchain stuff. Um, the thing that you're doing in blockchain, are you doing a a ERC twenty token that that like is your a singularity.net built on top of Ethereum or is it its own chain or are you, you know, how are you guys sort of putting all that together? Yeah. In a, in a, in a, in a number of different ways. So, I mean, we launched singularity net AGIX token on Ethereum blockchain because it was there and that was what to do in it's the only one with smart contracts to that level. Yeah, yeah. 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 We did, we did, we did that. And we, we built a platform that lets you run a bunch of AI agents sort of coordinating in a decentralized network to realize a, a distributed AI, AI, AI algorithm. And that that's, that's been, it's worked. It's been great. We've used it for various things. We're in the middle of a port to the Cardano blockchain, which is faster and cheaper. But sure. we've also started developing our own layer one chain called called Hypercycle, which oh, is a ledgerless blockchain. And that's oh, a whole wow. other bit of technology. We're like we're trying to make it vastly faster and cheaper by getting rid of the of the ledger, basically. And this this right. is a whole bunch of computer a whole bunch of underlying computer science improvements. You sort of sharding things all the way down so each participant in the network contains an encrypted version of their history and the histories of their of their their their, their, their neighbors so this i think this will be useful for metaverse applications also because pretty much everyone needs a, a cheaper mm -hmm. and more, more scalable blockchain so i mean i this is one of these things i totally didn't want to do because i just wanted that plumbing to work and to focus on building building ai but sure. finally came to the conclusion like if we want to if we want to do like atomic ai thought operations on chain at all we need much much faster yeah. cheaper blockchain I mean, look the than, romans than, than would have done much about. better if they had better plumbing right um so it makes it makes perfect yeah sense. i mean the same the same is held in every domain i mean like i I knew Philip Rosedale in the early days of Second Life, and that was mm. that was a beautiful virtual world platform in in its own way. Sure, but the way they built the server architecture under the hood, I mean, it was not at the level of like the early World of Warcraft or something, right? And if, sure. if they had done that, if they had done that plumbing in a sufficiently scalable way, in 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 the beginning, that 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 could have succeeded much, much better from the, from the get go. I mean, it, second life is still there though, which is cool. It's not, right, it's right. not like, they've, it's not, it's not like they've been a failure, but you could see that, you know, that began as like a one-off demo project. It's a side project when they were trying to build something else. Right. And they just didn't put that much engineering planning into it from, from the get go. Now with AGI, I mean, I, I think what I'm hoping to do in the next couple of years launch something way smarter than chat gpt for you know natural language dialogue and and visuals for that matter by putting and music by putting together llms with logical reasoning evolution mm. evolutionary learning other sorts of ai but launch this on a decentralized network platform right and so if yeah. you can do that then suddenly you've got potentially the bulk of the world economy running on a decentralized platform because the smartest yeah. AI in the world is right. And that, 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 that's what keeps me uh, at the computer till, till the middle of the night. Right. Amen. I, I mean, Amen. I love that. You know, it's, it's really interesting because my entire sort of mission statement is, you know, for is to lower the barrier to enter, to create VR content uh, to zero by using AI to bring that con you know, barrier lower and lower and lower. But after sort of chatting with you, I'm I'm kind of more interested in the idea of what happens if instead of creating tools for users to make UGC, which I still will do, is I create tools for the AI to create UGC, and what yeah. happens in that evolution, right? Like, I mean, like, co, co I think co-creation is really interesting too, right? I mean, because it's people like to create stuff, like in in music domain. In the 90s, I worked on algorithmic music composition, and it actually worked. I made some cool music. I got bored with it just because I enjoy writing music and yeah. improvising music. Do you know, right? a, I mean, do you know somebody named Andy? An AI to do it. 
Do you know somebody named Andy Milburn by any chance or Tom Hyde? No. Okay, because like no, I used to work at a company called Tom and Andy way back in the day. That oh had shit! In New York. Yeah, New York. yeah. So I yeah 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 so I yeah, yeah, at- yeah. I, I actually I some friends of mine did a contract for Tom and Andy in two thousand one. Which, right, which was doing using algorithm music composition with genetic algorithms. Yes, to basically they want to. The it's problem they the had was they had a commercial, they had an advertisement, they had a song that they couldn't license. They wanted AI to come up with something with a similar sound. Yes, fit in their ad. I I did a small contract for them, sort of explaining to them how, how to use genetic algorithms. Oh, that's amazing! That. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Small world. Yeah, I I um, that's where I got my start in the industry was working at Tom and Andy. Funny. You know, I I well, built yeah, that. That first- was like. I might, I might have met you there. I mean, I went to their, I went to that office in, in Lower Manhattan. Oh, in a Soho. Times. I was doing that. that... Oh yeah, my yeah, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like now, now that Montreal you say that, that, I, I, I do think I recognize game. you. I do think I recognize you. There was an Argentinian fellow that also worked there. Um, that 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 was like a programmer, but it was Andy Milburn was kind of like this very yeah, smart I, I, guy. I, 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 I did, I did meet Andy. I just forgot. The last name. There's been there's a lot of Andy's in the world, right? But yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was awesome, a cool, that was a cool office, Tom, Tom and Andy office. It was a really cool, really cool space, and that was, yeah. I mean, that most of my activity in algorithmic composition was in the mid '90s, like w- 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 well before that. But that that was mm-hmm. a that was that that popped up randomly at that at, at, at that point in time. Well, yeah, I was in I was in New York City then. Uh, so yeah, it was an amazing time in New York. So the great... no, it was beautiful time in New York. It was beautiful. So time. You, you remember you remember the Knitting Factory, John, John of course John Zorn's Music Club. That. Yeah, yeah, I was I was at the Knitting Factory all the time. We were probably we were probably yeah. in the audience at some of the same performances. Yeah. Oh man, and, and what was the other one? There was the one in uh, down in Canal Street where I saw Oasis yeah, the, the... play. Um, God, yeah, what was yeah. it called? Not the cameo. It had some kind of c word. Uh, oh God. Uh... Oh man, I forgot the name. But yeah, there was, it was a lot a beautiful... of cool experimental music clubs in the East Village then, which I'm 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 forget- a lot of little hole in the wall places whose name I'm forgetting. I mean, I mean, by then Knitting Factory was almost like in, in, in industrial, like that that that, right, that, right. that was the that was the mainstream of experimental stuff, and the really weird stuff was in the was in the Lower East Side, right? But yeah, yeah, so, I, man, was, I is... wasn't I wasn't playing music as as, as as much then, but my my musical mindset was sort of form, formed in in, in 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 that era. Then after that, I got more deeply into the keyboards. Right? Yeah, that, that's awesome, man. But look, man, this has been a fascinating discussion. Time has flown by. I appreciate you being so generous with your time. I'd love to, you know, try to figure out a way to get you into my platform because I think that you would appreciate the attempt that we're I'll, making. I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, let's communicate offline. Uh, tell me. Tell me, tell me what sort of uh, what sort yeah, of yeah, yeah. gear to buy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get back into it. And there, there may be some collaboration with what you're doing and stuff in in oh, one thousand percent ecosystem as, as 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 well. So yeah, let's yeah, and keep, like my platform is free to going. play. Yeah, so is... I'm trying to make it as open as possible um, because, like, my whole dream is like, how can I create producers? You know, like I want people to produce content, you know, to me, after reading Snow Crash around that same time, you know, where I was working at Tom and Andy, Snow Crash to me blew my mind because in a world where the, you know, the, the technology and the simulation was, was so overwhelming, you needed to be able to have interesting ways to create content. You know, and like for me, I'm a storyteller. You know, I'm a very simple guy. I like telling yeah. stories, you know. So anyway, man, this has so been for awesome. Production, yeah, for production of content. Yeah, you need to give people just higher level controls that are still meaningful, right? Is that, right. I mean, in music, I mean, in, for production, literally speaking, in music, like it takes so long to mix down a track that your band recorded, mm. but yet you don't necessarily just want to throw it into the auto mixer and say, you know, do it. I mean, you, you want, you want to be able to give high level direction and then go in and, and fix and tell it to adjust stuff and then 
tell it to introduce new things. So you, I think that at this point in history, interaction between human creativity and AI facility and limited AI creativity mm. is probably probably the, 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 the sweetest spot. Although yeah. having the AI just produce stuff on its own is, is also also very cool. There's a lot of money to be made that way. It's, it's, it's a challenge. I think it will have an overall positive impact if we can make things where human and AI creativity are sort of working hand in hand to make yeah. amazing like stuff. With- Cause that, that teaches the AI about the human heart, soul, and mind. And it gives people a sort of positive interaction with, with the AI and positive interaction of groups of people with each other centered around the AI. And I think that's, that's the sort of thing we want to bring about like a positive singularity right Right. yeah and and like you know in game design um which is like my sort of passion and my you know my love um has its own lexicon as well right like there's very specific tried and tested uh, uh languages towards game design and like there's never really been a good model that takes those like game design concepts and like synthesizes them and is able to potentially create New yeah, so the, the challenge there, and I, I haven't been a game player for a long time, but the, the challenge there is to have AI help the creation in a way that doesn't mute human creativity by pushing you toward just right trotting out of genre tropes, right? Like, because there's there's software for AI script writing for movies, and it's good in a way, but it will it will push you toward following the Hollywood formula and of course right game genres have their own formulas and it's not terrible you can have great great games following the formula just like there can be a brilliant new 12 bar blues song right but the the thing is if if the tools for following the formula are so much easier than the tools for doing something else then the the technology is actually channeling and squelching creativity rather rather Mm -hmm. than 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 enabling it right and this this comes down to why you want the indie world to be involved in the development of the tools, because that, that will lead to more, right. more diversity and more creativity friendly tools. Whereas if big companies develop these tools, just because of the structured ways they do th- things, these are going to come down to tools that encourage the creator to be as formulaic as, as, as possible, which then makes, makes the, right. the collective mind banal, right? So that's and it a, also controls the parameters of the boundaries, right? Like it, 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 like my biggest problem with open AI in general is that it's basically useless because you really can't get it to go beyond its very limited. Well, it's, re- it's really useful for it's really useful for for many things, but for creative arts, it's just banal as fuck right and and there's right, no right that's my point it is very useful like yeah. like it, it was a it was a, a a very you know broad statement but in terms of from what it could be if the people who control open ai just said let me get rid of these little limitations that are decided by seven people and let me let the people that are using it create the limitations yeah, for their you, own you use know you know how I've, how I've been using it to write lyrics is I have my other AI models, which are more creative and crazy, but less coherent. <laughs> I have it generate lyrics based on some prompts. Then I feed it to ChatGPT or Alpaca, and I'm like, take these lyrics written by a, you know, crazy but brilliant student, and sort of uh, <laughs> make them a little more in in, in meter and right. less insane. And th- then then it, it does a good job. So you sort of look. I, I use that as a regularizer of stuff that more creative AI sure. have, have have come up with. But yeah. yeah, if you just have it try to write song lyrics, it's just it's like Simon and Garfunkel at their worst or something, right? I mean, it just, yeah, yeah. It just reads like, you know, you reads know what like I've been using recently. Middle school. What, what I've been experimenting with with our so we have different tiers of NPCs in our game. What you know, some of them just have basic needs. Other ones have more complex needs, and the other ones have full-on uh, LLMs running their 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 minds. And um, I've been using this like open-source uh, r- software called Uba Gooba or Uga Booga. Have you heard of this one? 
Yeah, no. Gooba Gooba. Basically, it's it's like a way to organize all of the open source LLMs into one um, sort of like very neat kind of web UI. And it allows you to create incredibly um, um, sort of varied characters and character types. And, and, and the beautiful thing about it is that it's emerged this entire marketplace of, of, um, of characters uh, built in this system, um, like thousands and thousands and thousands of characters where it's like, you know, instead of having to go in there and write a thousand characters, you have these communities building all of these unique, weirdly nuanced characters out there. Anyway, it's called Uba Gooba is the web all UI. Right. I, will, I, will, I will check yeah. it out. And I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I'm, I'm going to have to vanish now. I've, I've got some other yeah, yeah. stuff I'm, I'm, I'm late for. But this has been a, been a fun conversation. I love digging into the creative arts side. Oh man, this has been a blast, Ben. Um, doctor, let's keep in touch. I'll uh, shoot you, um, you know, my info, and let's get you a headset and let's get you inside the platform. And I want you to check it out. Absolutely, absolutely, should be fun. All right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll even send you a headset, you know. So just so I know for sure you get it. Yeah, yeah. Where, 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 where are you based physically, by the way? So currently, I am based in the Florida Keys. In um, All right. yeah, yeah. I uh, lived in New York City for 25 years, then Los Angeles for five, and around the COVID times, I came down to Florida. You know, and yeah, I haven't I, left yet. I, I lived in Hong Kong 10 years. Then I moved to an island in the Puget Sound near Seattle. Right, oh, right when beautiful COVID Orca, also. Orca so, town. Yeah, yeah so awesome. COVID, uh, COVID definitely made it seem clever to leave the major urban areas into, into <laughs> the islands. Right, so, yeah. Thank you so much. All sir. right. This has Until been a the beautiful next time, experience. Man. Thank bye you bye. very much. Thank you, guys. We'll talk soon.